Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan, and I cannot express in words how glad I am to be talking to you again. It's been a rather rough week. Today is part four of Lighting for Photography. We're talking about fluorescent light and a little bit about hurricanes. So first things first, if you have written to me uh, or got in touch some other way, left me a message on Discord or anything like that, and I haven't responded to it, I do not have access to the internet. Uh, once this video is edited, I will drive around and see if uh, I can find somewhere that has internet, but it's unlikely that we're going to have it here for a while. The power came on half an hour ago, long enough for me to get my first shower in a week. Today is Saturday the 19th of September 2020, in case you're watching this in the future. And uh, a few days ago, we were visited by Hurricane Sally. It reminded me, I once dated somebody named Sally. Worked out about the same. Fewer down trees, maybe. But anyway, it was uh, a shocking experience. It was absolutely terrifying. Uh, I have been that scared before in my life a couple of times, but not for such a long period of time. Uh, if you've never heard a gigantic uh, pine tree snap in the wind, it's a, it's a sound you don't want to hear. And if you've never been through a hurricane, I hope you never go through one. My heart breaks for people in, in countries that don't have the resources to rebuild after something like this. It's been remarkable how much people have been working to, to bring this place back to some semblance of normal. Getting the electricity on inside of a week just blows my mind. There are, of course, places uh, down in uh, the Bahamas uh, and in other island states where they still don't have power. And it's been a year, and in some cases more than that. So, yeah, I feel for those people. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, I'll show you a few pictures as we go along, and I'm going to give you a few pro tips for hurricane survival. And I'm not kidding. This is stuff I learned from this hurricane. And uh, as we go through today's discussion, I'll, I'll mention those. Before we get going, thank you as always to my Patreon supporters and the people who support me through the donation page on my website. I need your help now more than ever and uh, it is really appreciated. Thank you so much. So last time we talked about incandescent light, and before that we were talking about sunlight. And now we're gonna move on to uh, a kind of lighting that I think gets, uh, gets pretty uh, short shrift when we're talking about photography. And that's fluorescent lighting because it's kind of been sneaking up on us as incandescent light starts to go away or has gone away in parts of Europe and most of Asia. Uh, fluorescent light is one of the, the most sensible replacements. It's inexpensive, maybe not quite so expensive if you, uh, if you figure in the cost of the electronics and the bulbs, but it's still fairly inexpensive. It's a very pleasing, soft light. It's well diffused naturally the way it's made. Fluorescent light is also extremely efficient. When we were talking about uh, incandescent light, I mentioned that most of the light bulbs you're familiar with uh, have a luminous efficacy of about 16 lumens per watt. Fluorescent uh, devices can get as high as 50 or even 100 lumens per watt, so they are a very efficient way to make, uh, to make light. There are drawbacks, but interestingly, there are fewer drawbacks now than there were even in the 
fairly recent past, and especially when it comes to photography, but I'll get to all of that in just a second. If you've been taking pictures for a while, especially if you've been taking indoor pictures and color indoor pictures, you're probably uh, still able to remember the days when you do just about anything to avoid having to take a picture in fluorescent light, unless you were shooting it in black and white. So if you were thinking of watching the first five minutes and then going back to the cat videos, you should probably stay tuned because uh, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised by uh, how much better fluorescent light has become. Depending on who you read, there are three categories of fluorescent light. There's electroluminescence, which really isn't fluorescent light. That's where an electric current passes right through a phosphor. It's the phosphor that is the conductor and causes it to glow. Uh, another kind that we're not going to talk about today, even though it is closer to real fluorescent light, and that is cold cathode fluorescent light. I've shown you these things before. This is an example of a cold cathode fluorescent light. It's a mercury vapor lamp um, from a computer, from a laptop computer. This illuminates the screen. So we're going to focus our attention on the hot cathode fluorescent lamp. Now, these things are amazing, and the way they make light is amazing. Fluorescent light was invented by somebody named Gessler. I guess you could say it was him that invented it. Like with so many inventions, there were a lot of people involved with it. He was the first one who had a documented record of making light from something similar to this. You wouldn't recognize it. It had all kinds of protuberances on it, and it didn't give off very much light. Tesla and Edison also worked on it, but a chap named uh, Edmund Germer from Germany, <laughs> <laughs> I think he was from Germany anyway. He was the guy that invented the fluorescent lamp the way we know it today. And by way of, uh, of context, it was only 1934 when these things became commercially available that you could buy them. And it was 1976, I think, before the uh, squiggly ones were invented. That's not long ago for something that we take for granted now. But these compact fluorescent lights haven't been around uh, 40 years either. Even Ikea makes a teeny weeny little one. So before I explain to you how these things are constructed and how they make light, let me give you Hurricane Sally pro tip number one. If you are thinking about moving to a place that is known for its hurricanes, don't. Don't move there. Move somewhere else. Preferably not anywhere with viruses or wildfires or tornadoes and hurricanes. All right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. What is in one of these things that makes it light up? Well, on each end, there is a tungsten filament that looks very similar to the tungsten filaments that we were looking at last time. The electrodes aren't bare metal like they were in the incandescent lights that we looked at last time. They're coated in either barium or strontium oxide. The reason for that is they make it more effective at doing the first step in lighting one of these, which I'll explain in a second. The tube itself is under low pressure and it is filled with argon, neon, xenon, one of the inert gases, usually argon because it's a lot cheaper. Now, the inside of the glass tube itself is where the action happens. That is coated with a chemical called a phosphor. And I'll get into what phosphors are and how they glow and why that's important in just a minute. But let's go back to the electrodes for a second. No, let's go even further back. You can't operate one of these things unless you have a piece of electrical equipment called a ballast. A ballast does three at least very, very important things with one of these bulbs. It lights it, gets it started. It limits the current that flows through it. And it also acts as a, a transformer to raise the voltage in the tube. 
So let's talk then about how this thing lights. So what happens when we pass electricity into one of these electrodes is the tungsten filament coated with the strontium oxide heats up. And when it does, it causes the argon gas that's in the tube to ionize. The energy from the current in the tungsten filament causes the argon gas in the tube to ionize. That puts it in a different electrical state to where it'll form what's called a plasma. And a plasma will allow the current, the, basically the free electrons that have been blasted off the argon atom to travel the length of the tube and complete the circuit. Now, that alone wouldn't make much light. It would make a kind of sickly pink glow. If you're as old as I am, you remember sitting in class in school where they had these noisy old fluorescent lights that would buzz and click, and they had a little white screw-in thing that would flash on and off and glow. No, you don't remember any of this. But okay, so nobody's as old as I am, but things have changed. They're a little bit simpler right now, but that is only the beginning of how light is made because on its own, that's not enough. Also inside this tube, is a little bit of mercury. It's in metallic form. If you look really closely on, on some light bulbs, you'll actually see a little dot of mercury that rolls around in the tube. So as the tungsten filament heats up, what it starts to do is cause a thermoionic flux, which is where it takes the argon atoms in the argon gas that fills the tube and it turns them into argon ions with the release of electrons. So this thing becomes filled with a cloud of high energy electrons. And because the tube also contains that little bit of mercury I was telling you about, all of that energy vaporizes the mercury. Then the atoms of the mercury vapor will force one of their electrons up into a higher energy state, which the mercury doesn't like and immediately drops the electron back. But as it does so, it releases ultraviolet radiation, UV radiation. In fact, very short wavelength, high energy UV radiation. So that is what's going on inside the tube. The reason we see light is because the inside of the tube, like I said, is coated with a phosphor. The phosphor reacts with the ultraviolet light and undergoes what's called the Stokes shift. We've talked about this, I think, when we're talking about natural light. That is where the phosphor, the, the chemical that lines the tube, absorbs the, the high energy ultraviolet radiation and releases what's left as visible light. That's called the Stokes shift. That's where the high energy UV excites the, the coating and releases a lower energy uh, radiation in the form of visible light. Because remember, visible light is right next to UV. So if you take away a little of the UV's power, what's left is what you, we see glowing. That is what fluorescent light is. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Everything is. <laughs> the, the big problem is if you were running a continuous direct current through this thing, it would still work, kind of, but probably no, it probably wouldn't work. Um, yeah, the, the current would probably run away, but it could work for a while. Let's say you had the right electronics. But eventually the tungsten electrode would lose all of its tungsten if the current was just going in one direction. That's not how these things are designed. The current actually is zipping backwards and forwards down the tube. And it's doing it at the same frequency that alternating current changes direction, which in North America is 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second. In, in Europe, it's 50 hertz. But that just means that in, in a second, this light, the, the electrodes change polarity 60 times. 
So a full cycle consists of lighting up this electrode and then lighting up this electrode, and then you start all over again. And obviously, that is something that is going to need to be controlled externally. Remember, in a regular light bulb, you don't have to control anything. You screw it in, it gets the power, it glows, and that's your light. But when you're dealing with this argon uh, energy plasma, as it lights up, and as the, the thermionic reaction gets more efficient, as the, uh, as the tungsten filaments get warmer, the resistance in this tube goes way down and the current wants to go way up. And in fact, if we didn't have this thing called a ballast, that's what would happen. These things would blow up. You'd turn them on and they'd blow up because the current would go as high as it possibly could and melt the tube. Uh, because of that plummeting resistance. So the ballast has a couple of jobs. The first is it bumps up your household energy, your household voltage, I'm sorry, from 110 volts in the US all the way up to about 220 volts. You need that voltage, that um, electrical um, uh, difference, if you will, to set up this reaction. So that's the first thing it does. The second thing it does is it limits the amount of current flowing through the bulb. It's got a thing called a choke, uh, or more than one chokes. And the purpose of the choke is to stop that runaway current, so it keeps the current limited. The third thing it does is it starts the bulb, and that, that involves a big spike of electricity right at the beginning until the bulb heats up and lights. You've seen them flicker to life. In fact, I've got a couple of pictures here to show you what a, a CFL looks like as it's lighting. It's not an instantaneous thing. Most uh, incandescent light, of course, is pretty much instantaneous on. As you've probably figured out, the single most important feature in one of these bulbs, once you have, the, once you have this argon plasma going and the mercury vaporized and it's putting off all that UV, the single most important thing that determines what the light looks like is the phosphor coating of the tube. And that is one of the places where most of the huge advances have been made in these tubes. Let me explain a little bit about phosphors, but before we do, hurricane pro tip number two. If you're anticipating a hurricane and you've decided you're going to stay where the hurricane probably is going to be and you want to make sure you have supplies, don't fill your freezer. It seemed like a good idea. But of course, when all the telephone poles and the power cables are snapped, your freezer will stop running unless you have a generator. Pro tip 2B, buy a generator. But if you don't have a generator, I had a year's supply of food in my freezer. And I'm a smart guy, or I thought I was, until the hurricane, until Sally, when Alan met Sally. So why did uh, fluorescent light get such a bad rap for such a long time, especially from photographers? Well, there are a couple of reasons. The first of which is the color of the light. Back in the day, there was only one phosphor that was used in the bulbs, and that was uh, calcium halophosphate. And it was doped, meaning the molecules of, of another element were added with two elements. One was manganese, which gave the light an orange look, and the other one was antimony that gave the light a bluish look. Now, the way that they would determine the color of the bulb was by how much of each dopant was used. And seeing as it was pretty much guesswork back in the day, most of the light would have a CRI or a color rendering index. That's how, how accurately a color is, is reproduced under this light of about 50. You want me to explain CRI in a bit more detail? Okay. If you have something that you're looking at, uh, say a color panel, and you're looking at it under 
full spectrum daylight light, meaning all the, the all the wavelengths are represented, and your thing looks these colors. Great. That's a CRI of 100. That's your baseline. Any artificial light that you use is going to run the risk of showing those colors to you slightly differently if the wavelength is not also pure white with a, a, basically a flat spectrum, meaning all the wavelengths represented. And these most certainly do not do that. Because the color is dependent on the dopant, and we're using two dopants, there are literally two spikes of color. Instead of a nice, smooth, all the, the lights in the spectrum color. So the idea is that you balance those two dopants so that those two spikes will work to, to give a light that's believable. And you can imagine that it was incredibly hard to do because while you can make light, this is called metamerism, and we'll talk about this separately, I think, was it uh, another day? It's so interesting, but uh, the fact that they can take two spikes of colored light and make it appear white is not the same thing as making it appear white and reflecting off other things as if it was full spectrum white. I hope you see what I'm saying. The result was the lamps had an absolutely appalling CRI and that human skin either looked infected or dead or it wasn't human skin. There were the three options you'd get from fluorescent light, which is why most fluorescent light back in those days stayed in places people didn't want to be anyway, like the factory. The second reason they were not enjoyed by photographers is because of that flicker that I mentioned, the thing that is caused by the ballast flipping the current one way and the other to ensure that the electrodes fire equally and wear equally and keep the, the argon uh, uh, ionized in the tube. But as the current is switching back and forth, the light bulb is dimming and brightening <laughs> on each cycle. So you have an ionization, you have the wave of energy passed to the other end in that plasma and the tubes as bright as it'll get. And then the current switches. Now this side has to momentarily also heat up, go, undergo a thermionic reaction and fire another cloud of electrons to the other electrode. You don't need a science lab to actually record this happening. I took This came out of an x-ray viewing box, one of those old fashioned ones where you put the x-rays up and it has four of these behind a nice diffusion panel. What I've done is I've taken the diffusion panel off and I just put one of these bulbs in and you are seeing the bulb operate under normal conditions. All I've done is turn it on. I'm shooting at one four thousandth of a second. Uh, and therefore you're seeing photographs of one side getting hot, the other side getting hot, the cool off in between, the dimming, the brightening. And then you can see just how big this problem is. We can even see it, but usually not with our uh, foveal vision, not with our uh, forward looking vision. We can see it in the periphery as a flicker. If we're around those old tubes, you'll see that. So one way that you can avoid this, if you find yourself having to take photographs under an older incandescent light fitting that's turned on and it's got that flicker going, is just set your shutter speed at the, the number of hertz that the light is operating at, which like I say, in North America is 60 hertz and Europe is 50 hertz. So if you set your shutter speed to 1 60th of a second, or 1 30th or 1 15th, so long as a, a cycle will neatly divide into your shutter speed, you'll get a whole cycle or two whole cycles or three whole cycles or four. The deal is you need to make sure that you're photographing at a speed which will give you full cycles. If you do that, you can overcome the problem. But that's only going to be if you find yourself shooting with these old bulbs. New bulbs don't do that. There was a third reason 
to hate the old fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, and it was to do with the manufacture and the way the phosphor was applied to the glass and the uniformity of the covering and the, uh, the amount of UV that was being put off is that UV would leak from these things. Now, even though the UV is really pretty high energy that these things generate, uh, it was uh, leaking in low enough levels that it, it probably wasn't a health hazard. I don't know that for a fact. I haven't, I haven't read anything about it being a health hazard. But it was terrible for things with certain kinds of pigment in them, like clothes, uh, clothing, fabric, tapestries, paintings. Some of those pigments, when they're exposed to this high energy UV, lose their color. They blanch the color out. So uh, yeah, that would make them kind of unpopular. I think that's what happened to Mona Lisa number one, the one that you can't see anymore. The second one was good too though. Hurricane pro tip number three. As the hurricane is approaching, well in advance of it, I recommend, go out in the garden and make a good guess at the height of all of your trees and then park your car at least as far away as the highest tree. I was off by six feet, but you live and learn. It wouldn't have made any difference because these trees weren't just falling over, they were snapping and then flying away. It was very Wizard of Oz like. I thought I saw our local meteorologist going by my window, but I think I was hallucinating by that point. Here's an interesting fun fact for you. Have you ever noticed uh, one of the old fluorescent light bulbs as it's getting to the end of its life that it's given off a really sickly pale pink glow right before it dies? Half the, <laughs> half the fluorescent lights in my school were like that. They were pink and noisy and uh, well, that's when they run out of mercury. If all the mercury has absorbed into the glass and there are no free mercury molecules, mercury vapor, to do this uh, energy swap with the electrons in the plasma, then all you can see is the plasma. And the plasma, and depending on the, the, the way the glass has been treated, is usually going to show up as a kind of faint pink color. Now you know. That's a dying uh, fluorescent. Have you ever wondered why that bottom of the, an old fluorescent tube will get black after a period of time? It's because the very oldest tubes did not use a shield around the filament uh, and it allowed the tungsten oxides to evaporate onto the glass. Now they put a, a sleeve of metal around it which absorbs that stuff and recycles the, the tungsten. I thought that was interesting. So, so far then we've learned that the color of fluorescent light comes from the material that's coating the tube. Everything else just produces invisible UV light, not counting the pink light. So that the actual light that the fluorescent tube is putting off is going to be a function purely of the, the uh, phosphor that is coated on the inside of the glass tube. If you change the composition of the phosphor, you will change the color of the light. So one of the ways the, the mix of phosphors is important to us if we're going out to buy a fluorescent light bulb is when we decide what color temperature we want, because now you can buy them in cool white, in neutral white, in uh, bright white and also in daylight. And they'll have, um, uh, they'll have color temperatures ranging from about 2,700 at the low end up to about 6,500 at the high end. So always be careful to check that if you're buying a fluorescent tube. But there's a lot more to it than just the, the whiteness of the light. There's how does it get that whiteness? Um, and like I said earlier, it's all about balancing several spikes of, of energy because the light is not being put out in a full spectrum like regular white sunlight or even incandescent light. 
it is being put off as some combination of color spikes that when viewed together appear to be white. So as the need for better color fluorescent light became more apparent, the first thing that they tried was just adding more red phosphor. Um, adding more red phosphor would uh, help balance out some of that green cast, they thought. <laughs> Well, it didn't really do a lot of good. The CRIs were, st were still horrible. But one thing um, is worth noting, and that is as you increase the amount of red dopant you put in one of these tubes or red phosphor, what you're going to be doing is putting out an even lower energy light. Remember that it's not the phosphor that's coloring the light. It's the energy from the, the drop from the UV um, energy to the visible light. If you're using a red phosphor, you're, you're absorbing more energy and releasing less. So as you shift a tube towards the red, add more red phosphor, you also have to account for the drop in luminance because our eyes are not nearly as sensitive to red light as they are to green light. So as you shift towards the red, these tubes become less efficient. So that had to be taken into account as well. These days, the phosphors are so much more sophisticated. Have you ever looked at a periodic table? It's got two humps of interesting elements on either side and then a strip of metals in the middle. And down at the bottom, there's two other rows. They look like things you probably wouldn't want to be touching or being anywhere near. Things like plutonium uh, are down in these actinides and lanthanides, as they're called. The really good uh, fluorescent lights that we use these days uh, use a, a chemical called lanthanum phosphide as, the, uh, as the, the main phosphor, and they're doped usually with cerium and terbium to give a bluish green color. The reddish uh, fluorescence, on the other hand, that comes from uh, yttrium, yttrium oxide or yttrium tetroxide, I think is the, uh, is the main phosphor, but that's usually doped with europium. You can tell from the names that these are scary uh, elements, but 98%, well, maybe 95% of good quality fluorescent tubes these days use europium and yttrium and uh, uh, terbium uh, for these colors because they do give a very believable white light. But still, remember, if you look at the spectrum of even one of these 98 CRI uh, fluorescent lights, it's still going to have two distinct spikes. Here's a fun fact. Woods lamps. Have you seen them on, on CSI, San Francisco, or whatever that program's called, where they creep around hotel rooms with a, a, an ultraviolet looking light looking for body fluids? That's a fluorescent light. It uses strontium borate doped with europium and some special kind of glass on it. That's how those things work. Now you know to irritate your partner next time CSI comes on, just throw out strontium borate and you'll seem smart. So in addition to having much better phosphors today than we did in the past, huge strides have been made on the ballast as well. It used to be that the ballast, like I described, was an electromagnetic device um, and Nowadays, most ballasts on most fluorescent lights are not electromagnetic, they're purely electrical. They use a completely different kind of circuitry uh, that is so compact that it'll fit in, well, this is not a good example, is it? This is not compact. It'll fit into the, to the base of one of these uh, compact fluorescent lamps. This is the ballast for the light and it's entirely electrical. So instead of producing light with this uh, periodicity of 60 hertz, like the older tubes did, this has a very, very much faster cycle time. They're called high frequency ballasts. The reason the high frequency ballasts work better and make more sense 
is because they, uh, they're they operating on the, the half-life of these excited electron states, which is a lot, lot, lot shorter than the periodicity of uh, alternating current. So these don't have flicker, is what I'm trying to say, with as many words as possible. So we know that fluorescent light has come a long way, and it's a lot better than it used to be. The light it gives off is a lot better. There are fewer of those casts. The CRI has gone from 50 to almost 100. Um, they're cheap. They're relatively compact. How are they for photography? Seems like an ideal light source. Uh, well, in many respects, depending on what you're photographing, they really are. The way we normally use them, because you have to accept the fact that compared to flash or incandescence, they do not throw their light. They're not super bright. They're super efficient. They're not super bright. As you can tell from just looking at the surface of one of these photographic bulbs, it's going to put out a diffused light, not really a bright point source. Um, which, if you're doing portrait work, is a really handy feature to have. First of all, if you're using these for, for portraits, you get this very soft kind of omnidirectional light that's very flattering uh, for, for skin and for people, or people with skin. <laughs> if they're very good for that. And another really big added advantage is how cool these devices are. Even the big ones run really cool. They get a little bit warm down where the electrodes are, but they cool to touch everywhere else. But one bulb, even a bulb this size, isn't really going to be very useful in the studio. You need more than one bulb. The way we get around that is using multiple heads meaning a device that you can screw multiple bulbs into. Now, I would like to show you one of those devices, but one of them is there and light travels in straight lines, so you won't be able to see that. And the other one is there. <clears throat> Maybe I can show you that one. Can you see? <laughs> can you see that? That's just got four and it's got two LEDs in it. <laughs> That was professional, but you get the idea. And they make those socket things uh, with up to, I think the biggest one I've ever seen has got nine individual sockets. If you take this, which is a 32 watt bulb that puts out 1700 lumens, if you put nine of these together in one light fixture and put a soft box on it, you would have an absolutely top-notch, high-performing studio light. It's what I use for, for my videos. Now, <laughs> it's what I use for my videos, but I have some really cheap lights, which is why people thought I was sick or needed to get some sleep. Normally, I try to balance it out with a warmer light as well. Uh, but uh, every time I look on death's door, it's because um, I messed up my lighting. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's a fact. If, you, if we just use the good, higher quality lights, you can get all the brightness you ever are going to need. And there are, there are actually other added benefits. Um, you wouldn't normally think about this, but if you're using fluorescent light instead of tungsten as the primary light, or even tungsten modeling lights, you can work in a much smaller studio than if you were using hot light like that. If you're using hot light, you really need to be in a fairly big space and you need to air condition that space. Now that might sound like a relatively trivial expense, but if you're in the studio all day, every day, it's not and you have to cool that space because you couldn't work in it otherwise. With these, you could have 30 of these things going uh, in a fairly enclosed space without ever having to worry about turning on the air conditioner. So for, for people like me, cheap, 
<laughs> this is a great solution. Uh, it's uh, it's much safer, much more comfortable, much uh, uh, easier to to use. And uh, yeah, I've been using the, these photographic fluorescents forever. You can also buy them in in banks. Uh, the the bank will usually have one or two or four. Uh, some will have even more than that. Uh, fluorescent light. Sometimes they're horseshoe shaped, um, and uh, they're about four feet long usually. And they they used a lot in the movies because the really high CRI ones do put out a very honest white light. And of course, the added advantage of keeping the set cool with one of those is huge. So a couple of warnings that you need to be aware of if you're using fluorescent light in the studio. One is don't try to get away with using like that x-ray box of mine. That would, that would be a terrible light because it has an electromechanical ballast. It's not only going to give me that flicker, but another thing that happens with the, uh, the older electromagnetic ballast is they can cause a, a beating effect in video where because of the synchronization of the shutter speed and the way that the light is flickering um, in harmony with the AC current, it can cause these blob-like um, uh, artifacts. They're not really artifacts, just stretching out parts of your image that are moving. It's very disconcerting. Just get modern bulbs and you won't have to worry about it. Another thing is that old electromechanical or electromagnetic ballasts can interfere with radio frequencies. Um, I've never actually seen it happen, but I've heard that, that uh, an older ballast can trigger flashes spontaneously. I would have thought it was more likely to just be a poltergeist and written it off, but apparently that's, that's a real thing. The modern ones, you do not have to worry about it because it's got an electronic ballast. It's not gonna, it's not gonna cause any of those, those weird blurry artifacts. It's not gonna flicker. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not gonna interfere with RF. They can be dangerous if you have a pacemaker, uh, but, but only if you like stab the pacemaker with the light, otherwise they're Otherwise, they're perfectly safe. One interesting thing about um, even, even some of the more modern fluorescent lights is they can't be dimmed. Now, as soon as I say that, somebody's going to respond that you can buy dimmable lights. You can. Uh, there are dimmable fluorescents. They are ridiculously expensive. And uh, I'm going to be talking about pricing in a second, but by and large, if you're if you're buying a relatively inexpensive studio setup, maybe half a dozen bulbs like this and some soft boxes, they won't be dimmable, and you don't want to put them on a dimmer circuit. That completely they won't light. It completely messes up the the timing of uh, of the bulb. I think it's time for pro tip number four. Before the, the trees have finished falling down, people will be knocking at your door asking if you would like to have that tree removed from your chest or your, your doors put back on. If, if these are people you've never seen before, um, they have either no van or an out-of-state van, uh, just be on the lookout because there are some really, really rotten people. And they'll show up and they'll, uh, they'll need to, to get money from you so they can go get the supplies and you'll never see them again. Um, it, um, it happens uh, way, way more than it, than it should. But that's a serious one. Be very, very uh, mindful of who you give your money to. It's best to, best to work with a realtor or somebody that you know uh, who can give you an actual name of somebody who can do the work. Another issue that you should be aware of, uh, though it probably won't come up that much, but if you do product photography and uh, you're doing a job where color accuracy is absolutely critical, 
if there's a logo color involved or something, you absolutely have to nail the color. You'd be better off not using fluorescent light. The reason is because of a thing called illuminant metameric failure, which basically goes back to that, that point that the fluorescent light is generally a blend of a couple of color spikes as opposed to a full spectrum white light which can uh, cause differences in reflected colors that may not be super important for most of the work that you're doing, but for, for something like a product shot where color is absolutely critical, you probably shouldn't take the risk. So one other important tip, if you're gonna use fluorescent light in your studio, either for still photography or for video, it really pays to do a manual or custom white balance. The reason is, as I've just explained, there are so many variables that go into making uh, these, these light sources that little variations in the ratio of, of, uh, of phosphors can make a big difference in the color of the light. Your camera has just picked a number for fluorescent light. Um, I, I don't even know what it is. And that's the, it'll correct all the colors to that number, but that's seldom gonna be accurate. You're much better off setting up a custom white balance. And all you need to do, if, if your camera will let you do this, I, I think most DSLRs do, is um, if you have a color card, it almost certainly on the back has an 18% gray panel. It's usually quite a big one. All you have to do is set your white balance to this and you're done. I, I actually, depending on the, the lighting situation, when I have my studio set up the way I will for a given type of job where my lights are in the same places, I'm using the same lights, I will set a custom preset for my camera so that the next time I'm making a video like this, I will use that template to set my white balance because I've already created a custom one. So look in your camera's um, uh, manual, you know, the thing you threw away the day the camera arrived, that will tell you how to do it for your particular model, but it takes literally a, a minute. So let's talk just for a minute about the cost of these things and how we modify them. Well, they are incredibly uh, versatile, much more versatile than you might think for something as ungainly as a four foot glass tube or one of these. But there are modifiers built specifically for this kind of lighting that is really affordable. You can buy uh, as of when my internet went off a week ago. The prices may have changed since then. You can buy uh, a light fixture to hold one of these, a bulb, maybe two bulbs, a stand, and a softbox. Not super fancy stuff, but you can get all of that for about $120. And that's a pretty good deal. Uh, you can buy these four-way uh, light fixtures I was talking about for about $10. Uh, though you can also spend $700 on one that has a name brand on it. It's still got the same number of screwy-in sockets. It doesn't have any other electronics in it. It's just the socket. So be careful with, with the pricing. Uh, the range of pricing for fluorescent lighting is stunning. Um, if you were to set up your studio, let's say you're starting from scratch, you don't have any studio, studio lighting, but you want to use continuous light. So you buy a couple of the, the um, multi-headed um, uh, sockets, maybe eight or 10 light bulbs, this type, 1700 lumen light bulbs, uh, three stands, two soft boxes, and a, uh, a couple of umbrellas. You could, you could outfit your entire studio for uh, $350. That's a guess. But I mean, if you, if you want me to put together a set that costs that, I'll, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. I mean, it's not, it, the stuff's not expensive. They sell 
fairly large light boxes like uh, 24 by 36 that are made to go with these uh, for about 120 bucks at Adorama or B&H. So when you consider what a name brand softbox for your studio lights, or for that matter, what your studio flashes would run you, uh, this is a very reasonable way to do most of what you're going to want to do in a studio. Now, as far as modification, there are modifiers for almost everything uh, that is on the market today, from the from the long four foot long U shaped fluorescent lights like this will often come in an enclosure with barn doors, barn doors to just limit the spread of the light. You have to remember that the light is omnidirectional. It's coming off in all directions and it's soft and it's diffuse over a fairly wide area. So that rather limits the point source modifiers that, that we sometimes use, things like snoots. But even though you can't use a snoot, one thing I do is I will put several of those bulbs in, um, in a soft box how did I tie a knot in a rubber band? And I'll use one of these. Um, it's a it's a grid that just stretches over the over the soft box. This is for a long soft box, uh, and that gives you directionality of the light. It stops the light spreading out so much and allows you to to control the spread of your light. So you can get away with using something like this. Of course, you can always stick these lights behind a scrim, and I like to do that because the light is already kind of like a bare bulb flash. And when you put it through a scrim, you can create a solid wall of soft light that is fantastic to use. Remember that, that uh, the, the light isn't gonna travel. The throw is unimpressive. Uh, so you're going to want to have your, your model very close to the light, but they can. They can sit close to it all day long because it's not hot. One thing when you're thinking about buying lights like this that I haven't mentioned is that the life expectancy of these bulbs, if you're living in a non-hurricane zone, is like uh, thousands of hours. This is an 8,000 hour bulb. That is pretty impressive. That's a lot longer than the, the bulb in my uh, modeling lamps on my studio lights is going to last, that's for sure. And and these uh, really do last that long, the new ones with the electronic ballasts. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're a movie maker, there are some really high-end fluorescent lighting options available. Kino Flow uh, is one company that makes a, a box with four of the the tubes in it, I think it's four, that have a CRI of 95, a thousand watts, and they come in a box with barn doors. I don't know if they have a stand or not, but that's $1,600 for that. So I came across one company called Mole Richardson that advertises a two bulb fluorescent fitting uh, for $900 and at the bottom it says bulbs not included. Okay. There's another company called Videscence who make a cold light with a K. Uh, they have some really high-end uh, movie stuff and you can get a couple of their uh, two light uh, cabinets uh, for around $3,200. I say all that just to say the prices are all over the place. So the take home is if you want to try fluorescent lighting for, for working in the studio, you certainly can at a really low price point, a lot cheaper than you could uh, outfit your studio with uh, studio flashes, that's for sure. Now, a completely different subject is comparing the price of the new type of fluorescent light with LEDs. But I'm going to save that till we talk next time uh, so that I can compare uh, all three of them together. But uh, that's going to be a much tougher decision. While you can certainly save a good bit of money with fluorescents over studio flashes, uh, that might not be the same uh, case with LEDs, but we'll have to see. 
So let's talk for just a second about macro photography and fluorescent light. Outdoor macro photography is pretty much out of the question unless you have access to four car batteries, two Sherpas, and an ass. Forget about it. It's impractical. I'm sure that somebody somewhere has invented a DC uh, fluorescent light thing that you could uh, use. But I would just forget about it if I was you and take a speed light with you. Compact, plenty of light, easy to use. But in the studio is a different matter. There are times when I will use one of these with a, a softbox and position it directly over my specimen. It doesn't happen often because the light is very non-directional. You have very little control over it. Reflected light tends to fall off very quickly. So it's very hard to use reflectors to get accent lights. If you have a, if you have a subject that would look good with that omnidirectional soft light, it's worth doing. It's very easy because these are light. So you can suspend one of these little soft boxes with one or two of them in it directly over your macro cage or whatever you're using and get very nice lighting. What it's not gonna do is get light into tight spaces. It's not gonna give you a, a lot of um, uh, balanced light if you're, if you're trying to create depth uh, by using a key light, a fill light. You really can't do that with this. For your everyday product photography light, to put stuff on eBay. Fluorescence, great for that, especially if you have or build a little light tent. Just a few surfaces of diffusion material with a couple of fluorescent lights around the outside makes for a lovely, uh, very uniform white color. I love it. It's, it's very easy to use, very good for that. It's excellent for doing 360 degree videos. If you're photographing on a turntable uh, or doing videos or stop motion, this is a nice, reliable light. Remember with fluorescent light, what you see is what you get. The last thing, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record on this, but shoot in raw. It is the only way that you're gonna be able to correct subtle or unexpected color casts from fluorescent light. It's not hard to fix, but if you don't shoot in RAW, you can't fix it. You need to have the whole file. So if you're using fluorescent light in the studio, at least until you are 100% comfortable with your lights, shoot in RAW. So let me see if I can sum up everything in just a couple of uh, key points. Fluorescent light these days is relatively inexpensive, relatively compact, it's cool, it's comfortable to use. Uh, it's very versatile and reliable. It's great for video, it's great for portraits, and it's great for still life. If you're gonna buy fluorescent light, take your time to do the research because there's a lot of garbage out there. In, as well as reading what the manufacturer says their CRI is, read the reviews. Read those trusted reviews from people who've actually bought the lights and you'll find out quickly that, that all CRI 95 lights are not created equal. So do your homework, you'll be glad you did. Be careful with planning your build because while the cost of a single bulb isn't all that bad, they do add up. When you're using fluorescent light, get a custom white balance. Don't rely on your camera's white balance. If you're shooting in somebody else's fluorescent light, for example, if you're, you're shooting a model uh, in a grocery store, why would you shoot a model in a grocery store? Anyway, definitely set a custom white balance. If you're relying on, on fluorescent light that's not yours, that you're not familiar with, go ahead and hedge your bets, shoot raw and shoot custom white balance. Before I go, hurricane pro tip number five. I made a stupid decision to stay here. I'd never lived through one of these things. I had no frame of reference for how brutally violent these storms are. The reason I stayed was so that I could protect my stuff. 
you can't protect stuff from a category two hurricane unless you move that stuff somewhere else. So what you have to do is grab the important stuff, your cameras, your cantaloupe flavored wine spritzers, one of your children and the cat and go somewhere. Just go away for a day or two, come back and clean up the mess. At least the mess won't include you. You can forget all the other advice I've ever given you, but take that one to the bank. If there's a hurricane coming your way, go somewhere else. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you enormously, and I'll see you again in a few days. Until then, stay safe. It's getting harder to do, isn't it? But stay safe. Cheerio.